Uh, hi everybody, uh, welcome to Game Night. Uh, my name's Anna, we have Anthony and Alexander with us. And uh, just as a reminder for everybody, this webinar is being recorded for anyone who couldn't make it tonight, so it'll be around for later on. Um, hide your face if you don't want to be seen. And uh, firstly, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So we would like to thank Screen Australia for their funding and support in making this webinar happen. And of course, the Australian Writers Guild for inviting us to speak to you all tonight. Um, sure, you're all total Zoom experts by now, but as a reminder, we actually have a Q&A function instead of just the chat function, which you can use to ask questions as you go. I'll try and keep track of those and um, pull them out whenever they seem appropriate. So you can talk and chat, chat to each other and everything, but we might not keep a close eye on that as we go. Um, so first, Anthony Sweet is going to tell us about the essence of writing for games, what actually happens when you write for a video game, and what oh. makes it unique. Great, thank you Anna. Uh, my name is Anthony Sweet. Let me just share screen so we can get this up and running. There we go. Excellent. So as Anna said, my name is Anthony Sweet. I am the lead designer and writer at Black Lab Games uh, over in Perth, where we currently have been making stories for the Battlestar Galactica franchise since 2017. And I am here to talk about the, start us off with the fundamentals of interactive writing and just try to get a, a good ground base of same language and concepts for everyone to work off before we go into some of the more uh, trickier areas. So one of the things I've wanted, I've basically got three ideas that I wanted to talk through. Um, uh, this whole idea of the fundamentals of interactive writing is something I would typically take six lessons, six weeks to teach and trying to condense it down into 10, 15 minutes is a bit of a task, but uh, um, we've got it here. But this is one of the main, one, one of the very first things I like to uh, talk to folks about with interactive writing is uh, the idea of story as context. And that being that, um, in, when, we do, when we're dealing with game development, when we're dealing with uh, games and interactive media in general, uh, the narrative shares an equal billing with gameplay. Um, it's, it's, narrative is very important, story is very important, but we also have an as equally important aspect to games, which is the gameplay, which is a very unique beast in and of itself. Um, and as part of that, uh, what we're trying to do as narrative designers, as people who write for games, uh, is we're trying to create a harmonious experience with the gameplay. Um, there are times where if you're playing a game and you become frustrated because the story seems silly or it's jumping all over the place or it doesn't quite make sense. Or on the other hand, where the gameplay doesn't seem to quite make sense to what the character was talking about, your quests aren't as exciting or as um, meaningful as what you'd hope for. What you're looking there is that there hasn't been a harmonious experience. And on the other hand, when something, when a game just completely sings to you and it is a wonderful experience that you lose yourself in for 14 hours straight and you wake up at the end of it and uh, wonder what happened, that was the, a situation where an entire development team, including the narrative designer and everyone else, were able to create that harmonious experience with gameplay and storytelling. Another part of story is context is a uh, when we're dealing with games, we're dealing with a player controlled camera. Um, and as you can imagine, this can be very unpredictable. Uh, this is one of the main reasons why you see in a lot of triple A games, what we call triple A games, the really high profile um, tentpole games on a lot of platforms. Uh, there's a, uh, what we're used to is seeing is cinematics in those big games because when there's a big story beat coming where something pivotal and dramatic and earth shattering is about to happen, we can't risk the player swinging the camera in the wrong direction and completely missing this big important thing that's about to happen in front of them. Um, so that's the context for why you often see like a lot of cinematics in these big games um, because a player controlled camera is very unpredictable. Um, and it's a, what part of our job as narrative designers is, how do we cover the player's mistakes, which I say with in air quotes, but how do we keep their attention in what's happening in front of them? How do we keep their attention to the pacing and the beats of the story in front of us when they're the ones which are wholly in control of the experience? And a lot of that comes down to the way that we design our stories and we design our worlds. 
And the, uh, something which goes hand in hand with this as well is the concept of the player verbs. You know, we as uh, game writers, we're often writing for you plus verb, uh, which equates to our player verbs. And this is the essential, like, what can the player do inside of this game world? Um, and it can be, I've heard a lot of stories where the narrative, uh, narrative designer hasn't kind of been looped into that larger game design talk about what can the character, what can the player do inside of the world? And that's resulted in some really awkward conversations later. So an example of that is um, both Nathan Drake and Lara Croft, respectively from the Uncharted and the Tomb Raider game, they are specifically designed for a very specific set of player verbs. They can run, they can jump, they can climb, they can shoot, they can grab treasure. Um, they can sneak. And these are all very specific player verbs. And as a writer in games, like we need to know what the player verbs are in a game so that we don't all of a sudden say, all right, so Lara Croft then jumps into a helicopter and she controls this, uh, this missile launcher, which blows up a, 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 a tomb. And then she jumps out with a parachute. And like, all of a sudden, I've just used three verbs, which a game doesn't support. Um, so as a writer, it's really important for us to know what are the constraints which occur in the game mechanics. Um, and a lot of that just comes down purely to what are the controls we give to the player that allow them to do what they do in the game. So that's a very, very quick, I should say, and a, um, a very uh, small look at the idea of story as context and how it works with gameplay. The next part I want to talk about is and um, I'm going to have to apologize if I'm just zipping through this, but there is quite a bit we're trying to get through here just to lay some foundations. Um, the next thing I do want to talk to is the idea of uh, structure in games. Um, and this is a conversation I know I've had and I know um, Anna has talked about having with other folks as well, the idea of the nonlinear structure and what that actually means in games. Um, when we talk about nonlinear structure in games, we're not necessarily talking about a nonlinear timeline, like what we see in a lot of films and flashback scenes and that kind of thing. We're actually talking about the, a nonlinear experience, which is fundamental to player choice and player agency. Um, and I've got some uh, examples here of what we can talk about. So like, for instance, up on screen at the moment, there's a quick diagram for what a linear structure looks like. As you can see, there's no, every node represents a story beat. Um, and there's no player choice involved there. It's just very much straight from A to B to C to D. Um, then when we talk about branching narratives, this is very similar to if you remember your old school choose your own adventure books back from the, when we, whenever they were published ages ago. Might, maybe I'm showing my age now. Um, but this is unrestrained player choice where at every node there is, at well, most nodes, the player or the reader or the audience member has an opportunity to make a decision and it fundamentally changes the setting, what happens next, which characters are around. Um, this is where, this is the kind of thing that people typically think of when they first start getting into non-linear uh, narrative design um, and branching narratives get very expensive very quickly. Um, that is something I could probably do an hour long lecture on just by itself. But typically what you'll see in games instead is what's called a parallel structure, um, which is a combination of the two. You know, we're dealing with a, a fairly linear where everything kind of pulls back into the main story beats, as you can see in that third node and then the seventh node, but it still allows for some player agency, allows for some choices to be made along the way. And that's this is a very common kind of structure that you would see. And this is what we would overall defined as a, this is very much a non-linear structure. So as, as you can see, when we're talking about non-linear structure, then it's all about from the choices the player is making, how that influences the character and the setting and the plot, um, but not necessarily about, we're not talking just about non-linear timeline, we're actually talking about control and agency. So that's the second thing I want to talk about. And the very third fundamental I want to talk about is the idea of games literacy. Um, and this comes from a place of, I have had conversations previously with folks who have been interested in writing for games. Um, and the conversation typically I would go ask, okay, great. So what kind of games have you been making lately? Or what kind of time games have you been playing lately? And the answer reply would be, oh, no, 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 no. I, I don't play games. That is, a, that is not for me. Um, and 
I feel like this is a kind of a dangerous uh, place to put yourself in. And I don't want to say this as part of some kind of gatekeeping, but it's just that we're talking about fundamental skill set. Um, I've never written a movie. Um, and without studying movie and studying movie screenplays, I wouldn't expect myself to be able to write a movie because there's a lot of the nuances, there's a lot of skill set there I don't have. And games can be a very technical uh, medium to work in. And without having the experience and without opening yourself to the experiences of games, um, it, it can be very difficult to then understand how a story works in an interactive environment and what characters can say and do in an interactive environment that makes sense to an audience member. So I feel it's very, very important um, to open yourself up to a lot of different interactive experiences. And I don't just say that as, I'm just gonna quickly stop the share now. Um, I don't just say that uh, now as something to, you have to play everything, but uh, it's, and also don't just play stuff in the genres you enjoy. Like there's a, a big breadth of games available um, for folks to uh, take a look at and take things from. And I know Alexander's going to talk a little bit later, but he's got a reading list of games to start on. Um, and I'm sure myself and Anna will probably throw some more into that as well. Um, and I know it's a question that a lot of folks have asking about what are some good games to try to kind of find out what constitutes a good game story. So I'm sure we'll get to that later. But anyhow, those are the three fundamentals I, I was, uh, wanted to talk about, and I hope that helps. I was going to say, we can uh, <clears throat> argue about which games are good and which ones aren't. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There is uh, an Abby, endless talk. Abby, can I just get you to explain something very quickly? You just sure. mentioned there about um, how branching can get very expensive really quickly. Do you just want yes. to kind of explain what you mean by expensive? Okay, sure. Um, in terms of expensive, uh, when we're dealing with game production, uh, you know, we're off and let's just make the assumption we're talking about 3D. It doesn't even have to be 3D games, 2D games. Um, if you start making a purely branching narrative where a player's making a choice at every node to go to a new location, um, and I know this is a problem that a lot of adventure games have. If we went back to that screen I showed before, those six, uh, I think it was four uh, choice nodes resulted in 16 different endings. Uh, so if each one of those equaled a brand new location with brand new characters and brand new uh, um, plot devices and like it just becomes expensive to write and it becomes expensive to create the all the environment and expensive to record and expensive to for the mechanics for all of those to be interesting as well. Um, it's uh, localization costs as well would get yes huge. absolutely. Uh, if you don't know what localization is, that's your translating. If you've got voiceover, it's translating voice and text in the game as well. Some games are mostly text-based, some are lots of voice recording, but either way, it gets very expensive. Right, that was me. Oh, um. I have a couple of questions that people asked ahead of time that kind of relate to what you were talking about. Uh, one of them is, how much focus is there on incorporating game mechanics into the stories that into the story's themes. I think it's fundamental, to be honest. Um, like, I think the, you know, this is a, this is, without getting too far into the weeds, you know, this is a conversation that, you know, we see a lot in academia and in game design discussions and a lot, you know, what, what comes first, the mechanics of the story and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I personally, um, maybe I, I, no one else agrees with me, but me personally, I believe that like they both have to be created both at the same time. Like they have, it has to be something that's constantly iterated on, which I know is something that, um, uh, you two are going to talk about as well. Um, but I really feel like uh, when it comes to the, it goes back to that play of verb idea as well, right? Like we know that Lara likes uh, solving puzzles and she likes finding treasure because those are the two main things that like you're most empowered to do when you're playing those games is solving the puzzles and gaining the treasure. Um, and I think it's like when, a, if a game story feels weak or if a game's gameplay feels weak, there hasn't been a lot of cross-pollination between the design and the story there. Um, but when they do really fit together, and a, a great example of this is a, a recent game called Disco Elysium, which is a detective RPG. Um, and it is 
very wild and out there, but fundamentally it's hard. It knows that it's a mystery. It's a detective story and the mechanics support the detective story. And on top of that, the story then supports the way those mechanics unfold and the way that the gameplay unfolds as well. How about yourself, Alexander? How do you, how do you feel? Uh, yeah, look, I can speak from experience because I freelance uh, mostly. Um, and usually what happens is the game is, you know, 20, 30, 80% through development. And then someone in the team goes, oh, we should probably get a story person. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the player actually understands what the hell they're doing. Um, you know, and so then I end up kind of fighting my way back to try and make sense of everything. And also too, it just becomes really obvious then what opportunities were kind of missed because they didn't have narrative being um, developed at the same time. Because often what happens is, you know, I take what I can from what the team um, has been doing put it through a narrative design kind of lens and then feed it back to them. And then they go, ah, oh, we should have been doing this verb. It would have been so cool if we had this verb from the beginning to yeah. tell this kind of story um, that they want to tell. Um, and also too, you know, sometimes it does get to the point where it's like, okay, I actually can't get this to make perfect sense to the player. The player is going to lose a bit of emotion in this experience, not going to quite understand, um, you know, why or what they're doing um, to the extent that they could. Um, and um, that's always a shame. So I, I'm very lucky to be working at the moment with um, with Brittany Pickle on Totem Teller. We have a really good kind of um, looping nature to our development where narrative informs design, design comes up with ideas, loops back to narrative that gives me ideas. And so the game, the game for, um, goes through iterations like that. I think that's ideal. Yeah, I agree. I'm um, actually in the unusual position of my current project that I am helping to design the narrative tools that we need for the project. So coming up with that in the first place, which, you know, is really unusual to be brought on so early. Usually it's, yeah, come back and retrofit to make sense of everything. And, and yeah, you miss out things. It's a lot like um, Simon Valent in our chat just mentioned that's a lot like audio. And that's very, very true. Often audio and narrative are, are left to the last minute. And it's such a shame because you can do amazing things if you think about both of those things together as well from the very beginning because audio is an awesome tool for narrative um, not just voice recording but just using it to tell environmental stories and things like that which is um, yeah a really great tool um, so we had another question which is a, a really interesting one which was around would you recommend trying to break your nat narrative up into chapters during the first write through or would it be better just to write it out and break it up later um, and I think there's a big assumption in that <laughs> at the beginning, which is that you get to write the narrative of a story before the game is made, which certainly has never happened for me. Um, I don't know about you two. No, I don't think that's ever going to happen, really. I mean, unless it is a writer who is kind of leading the project and they do have the luxury of getting, um, you know, um, the opportunity to work on it themselves first, and maybe they're yeah. the one that's actually used one of the tools. Um, to come up with a prototype in a kind of branching or interactive um, narrative kind of way and then they let it, then there might be a bit of an opportunity, but that's very, very rare. Um, yeah. So, um, it, the, I mean, I'll, I'll just, I've noticed a kind of few questions coming through in the mm. QA too about structure and things. Um, you can kind of, uh, to a certain extent, throw out any kind of understanding, understandings of structure from, say, film and playwriting or even novels and so on mm. um, in terms of games. Because every project is different, every game is different, um, and um, a lot of what, um, like what um, Anthony was talking about in terms of matching up the needs of narrative to design means that your structure will have to be bespoke, basically, yeah. um, to every single game that you do. Which isn't to say that you can't make certain assumptions or generalizations, um, or even you know a look at games and analyze and see structure in it. It just means that it becomes less important to talk about things in terms of discrete, say, chapters. Um, and more about, say, sequence of events or levels or, um, you know, depending on, on what's required for the game. Yeah. Um, what I might do is I will go through my little set of slides because that does answer a couple of these questions. And then I'll, during the slides, though, I'll open up to talk to you guys as well because I think there's some stuff that we can talk about that will answer some of these questions as we go as well. So let me just see if I can have to share your screen. Alrighty, so um, this is, from my perspective, a lot of the work that I've done has been, <clears throat> excuse me, physically embedded in the studio. That's not always the case. Sometimes you just do it all remotely. Um, but there's some real advantages being in there with the team, particularly in terms of being visible. And so the team thinks about narrative, which they might not do if you're not around. Um, so 
there's writing, <laughs> so much writing. So a lot of the questions we've just had have been around writing a script for a game. Uh, the thing is that that's not the only kind of writing you do in a game. Um, and there's a, actually a big debate between what a writer does and what a narrative designer does, and if there are two different roles or if they're the same role. Narrative design blends more into the, the design aspects of the game where you're thinking about quests and all of those other kinds of things. Writers generally might give you, uh, for example, I worked on Ashen, which came out a couple of years ago, and for that they hired a writer to give them their, their initial concept. So the whole initial game concept, the backstory to it, and he wrote up a little short, almost a short story for them. Then two, three years later into development, they realized that writing is actually hard for in-game content. And so they hired me uh, to help them actually madly, frantically try and actually give them dialogue and quests and things that actually worked. So they sort of started with that, that idea at the beginning with a, a more, many, he was actually a novel writer, and then hired somebody like me to come along. So there's a lot that we end up doing. Um, what I did was I asked uh, some fellow writers on Facebook some questions um, around what it's like working in a studio, what surprised them about working in games. Um, and one of them was, was that idea that one little thing that you change in your narrative can have a huge ongoing effect. Um, a good example of that, again, with Ashen, I had a, a character who I had made, only had like eight characters to play with. And I would made this really cool storyline. I had them all interacting with each other. And then they cut one of the characters because they needed the, the asset, the art model and the 3D model for this character for an enemy instead. Which meant that I lost one of my characters which I'd wrapped intertwined all these clever stories with and I had to just retrofit and, and you know, make it all kind of happen. So a little change one way or another can, can have this huge ongoing effect and it's something that you really have to be aware of. Um, at a really high level, this is the kinds of things that you'll see in a game studio, depending on the size. Um, there may be one of these people or some people will be doing multiple of these tasks. Um, and or you can have huge, huge teams. Um, in Australia, they tend towards, let me think, as small as like five people up to your 30 people or so. Have we got big ones left? Uh, we lost a few just recently, so not sure what we've got left in terms of size. But obviously you can get hundreds, uh, depending on who it is. So the other thing about this, working in a team, getting everybody on board. So if you've got this awesome story and you, you really need the rest of the team to kind of be with you on that story. So a lot of your job is getting their buy-in, working with them, talking to them, making sure that they understand what you're trying to achieve with the story. Because in game development, it's very easy to cut a character, cut a level, just pair things back. And so if you're in the studio, you have that opportunity to, to talk to people, get their buy-in on things and get their collaboration. Also pinch their ideas, because there's lots of really cool ideas out there. You, you don't need to work alone on making this happen, especially when there's this concept for a game. Everybody plays games and, sorry, my screen has frozen, but hopefully it'll come back to us. So things that I've been asked to do in my studio, or various studios. These are the kinds of tasks. This is not an exhaustive list of all the sorts of things that people do when they write for games, but it's some of them. So I've written dialogue, uh, including barks, and you might not know what a bark is. I don't know if that's just a games only term. So that's things like when you're, you encounter an enemy or you get shot by the enemy, you go, oh crap, or ha, ah, he's over there, or something along those lines. So there's all the sorts of things that your characters might shout. Um, then there's designing and documenting characters, creating item descriptions. That's a huge, huge task, uh, depending on the game. Uh, design fake languages, that's a fun one. Um, write notes, books, audio scripts for in-world items that the player can read or listen to or pick up. Uh, documenting the world lore and story designing quests. So not just writing the quests, but actually designing how it works. I've even gone through and picked out locations in the game world where something should be hidden, as well as writing description around it. Um, Scripting, you know, it actually helps to know how to write a script because occasionally you do actually do that. We get voice actors for things. Um, uh, I've talked to journalists to help the, you know, team actually know how to write something well. So there's a bit of copywriting sort of stuff. Creating um, game screenshot posters with character quotes for social media and actually drafting social media posts, as well as going around and giving everything a name, which can be its own little nightmare. 
So that's that's a small list. I'm sure Anthony and Alexander have done many, many more things. Um, but it's just a start to give the idea of the kind of things that you might do if you actually get hired as a game designer. So tools. We've had quite a few questions around the tools that you can have. Um, and I really like these quotes from somebody who came in from the more traditional industry years ago. So their biggest challenges were learning how to write non-linear story and dialogue. That's, that's a big mental change. Um, there is dealing with crunch. Anthony and Alexander, I imagine crunch is something you're familiar with as well. Crunch is when either planned or unplanned, they, everybody works overtime. <laughs> and it can be super crazy. It's better now than it used to be. Uh, but it can still be a thing from two hours over time every night, the whole studio trying to meet a deadline. Deadlines get very, very inflexible in game development sometimes. And so, yeah, it's a real challenge. Uh, not having any established way of doing things or any established method for creating design or design. It's really hard. It's, it's all different. It's always different. You can't write a script. I use so many different tools. Um, and, you know, on a slightly less glowy note, that surprised and horrified by how little thought people give to writing. They don't realise, nobody would ever try and make a movie without a script. But people do try to make games without them. And, and they, just, they just don't think about it, or they think they can do it. Everybody can write, they all went to school. Um, you know, how hard can it be, right? Luckily, sometimes people feel about it. And these days, there's, there's an expectation from the audiences that is far greater for quality stories than we had before. So it's, it's getting better. <laughs> it's not there yet, but it's definitely getting better. So some software that I use regularly. Un <clears throat> Excuse me. Unreal and Unity, they're game design tools. They're engines that you use to build a game. So everybody will be working with that. And I sometimes work directly with those tools. Uh, Confluence is a, I don't know what we call it, um, it's a tool where you, it's like the whole repository of everything about the game. So I'm using that at the moment for documenting everything from the backstory, the lore, the character designs, the rest of the team is putting their designs in there. It's a huge collaboration tool. It's like Google Docs on speed. Um, Jira is a task workflow tool project management tool, uh, very pop popular. Wik is supposed to be wiki, um, so Wikipedia kind of style, style wikis that will do the same sort of thing that Confluence does. And then you've got your custom built tools that people, you'll get your programmers to make for you and then you can enter your stuff into it. Sometimes they're great, and like they could be every single string of dialogue that's in the game you have to write into this tool and you can't search or spell check or a spell check is a nightmare. It's, it's so hard to keep track of that. Sometimes people will go in and make a change to a word without talking to you about it. And then you'll just notice later on that they've done it and done it wrong. Um, Google Docs, Sheets and Slides, I use all the time. Uh, Microsoft Office Suite, I use all the time and all of them. Excel is your best friend. Um, Lucidchart or Visio are great for especially branching narratives because it gets big and complicated and really hard to keep track of. And never underestimate when you're in a studio, studio the usefulness of post notes, whiteboards, and actually having a chat with somebody. Those things are really, really, really important. Um, I'm just going to kill my camera because that's like the worst possible pose. There we go. Me looking less horrendous. Um, Alrighty, so that's kind of the, the overview of, of life in the studio. I love doing it. Um, I don't love the commute. I love the fact that we're all working from home at the moment. It's great. But there are some real, real advantages of that ability for somebody to pop past your desk and say, hey, Anna, um, what's the story of these people in this game? I'm trying to create art for them. I don't know what they do. You know, what do they like? Do they, you know, are they high tech, low tech? All of those sorts of questions. And that's where you go, oh, well, this is my design, you know, idea for these guys. This is their backstory. And that helps an artist come up with designs for things and all that kind of fun stuff. So hopefully that answers some of the questions, especially when it comes to software that you can use. There is no final edit for games. <laughs> there's, there's just, it's so variable um, that really it's a matter of, you don't have to be an expert in, in Unreal and the, the really technical stuff. 
Um, but yeah, usually it's yeah stuff like that. How are we going for questions? We've still got quite a few in the open. Um, All right, so narrative tools that you developed for you in games and what they let you do. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm just trying to think of a really good example of that. Currently, for example, the list of tools I have to deliver narrative for the project that I'm working on range from cinematics, which are actually quite expensive. So fully scripted, pretty art, the player watches it, doesn't interact with it. Um, interactive dialogue, so the player clicks on another character and talks to them and there's lists of dialogue that they, the person will say, oh no, I've hurt my toe, can you please help me find something to fix it? Um, and the player says yes or no, and in which case the other character might respond. So those sorts of little dialogue snippets. Um, when I get a tool developed for that, for example, in Ashen, I used Unreal and what they did was build me a tool within Unreal itself where I could go in and I had a crash course in Unreal Blueprints, which taught me how to actually find the bits of dialogue and edit them. And that got really uncomfortably challenging. I would have to document everything, every change I made, made I kept documented in, um, I ended up using Google Sheets uh, and I kept documented in there so that we knew what was there and so I could spell check it and we could review it easily. But then it's that back and forth between the game, making sure the dialogue that you put in there is actually in there um, and keeping track of that. So it's time consuming and a little bit painful. Um, and how many times was the tool updated? Sorry, how many what? How many times was the tool updated? While you were, you, I found it too sometimes. <laughs> that I just impressive. managed to learn how to use it. Oh. And then the programmer then goes, I've done this thing, it's awesome. And then you yeah. have to learn how to use the tool. I'm trying to use a tool called Bolt at the moment, which is visual scripting <laughs> for Unreal. Uh, sorry, for um, Unity. So it's a little bit unreal, like Unreal, but not entirely. And then suddenly Bolt 2 come out. All the tutorials relate to Bolt 1, not Bolt 2. So I'm like, can we not update to that just yet? So <laughs> play it around one tool. It's just, because um, yeah, it does update. And when I was working on Ashen, the tool that I was using, like we would make changes on how the, um, for example, whether the player was forced to do an action or not. So does the player have to accept the item the NPC is giving them? That's a non-player character if you really don't know. So can they say no and refuse that item? If they say no, then they can't do something else later on. Okay, so we need to make a, an alternative possibility in Unreal that goes, okay, well, if not this, then that when they go to this other location, they get another opportunity to get that item. They can still say no, and if that's the case, then all right, things are problematic. But every time you do that, it makes it more complicated and it gets really hard to keep track of all of those options in any given tool. Um, I was using Google uh, Sheets because then everybody on the team has access to it. If you're trying to do it in something else, then you lose visibility and that's a real problem as well because the rest of the team needs to know what's happening so that if they make a change or they need to see what's happening, they, um, they can make art for it, all that kind of extra stuff. So that's that one done. Um, what else have we got? So that answers the software question as well for Kyle. Um, do I, oh, this is a really interesting. Do we think that a branching story or one with multiple endings gives a better player experience? Not necessarily. Yeah, that's um, okay. Yeah, I, I think it's more in the implementation of it. Um, I have played games which have had a very linear experience and have been incredibly heartfelt and moving. Um, the last one was and amazing and almost entire, it was entirely linear. Sorry, which one was that? The Last of Us. Oh, yep, The Last of Us. Um, uh, Everybody's Gone to the Rapture is one for me, which I, I absolutely love that. And that is uh, beautifully written and it's very little agency and choice to be had in there um, but it still tells a beautiful story and because a lot of it is environmental the moving around the uh, location you know there's still wonderful interactive sequences there um, all the other games were fantastic well i love them anyway that was super fun engaging and pretty much linear yeah um a, a point i want to make there is that um respecting player choices is probably the most important thing when you're deciding between branching 
and uh, non-branching. Um, and there's two particular writers I want to point out in regards to this. One is Hannah Nicklin, um, who recently uh, wrote uh, for the game Mutation. And she did a GDC talk about um, writing, particularly for an ensemble cast. And because of the nature of an ensemble cast, meant um, uh, branching would have been incredibly expensive when they did it. So she kept on talking about the, um, oh, I can't remember the exact term she used, but basically it was like a lot of the choices in the middle of the story would be where the player gets to make a lot of decisions, but the end point of that particular story beat would still be the same. There'd be variations to it based on what you've done and the way characters would react to it. But ultimately the plot continued forward in a fairly linear fashion, but it was the nonlinear middle uh, which allowed it to happen. Um, and then the other writer I want to um, give a shout out to, and I saw his talk at GCAP quite a few years ago, David Gator, um, who is a fairly um, well, is a very well respected and well known writer for, um, with his work out over at Bioware. Um, and he talked about quite a while ago at a talk I went to um, about respecting player choices. Um, particularly for the games where he was writing uh, called Dragon Age, where not only was there massive amounts of choices to be made, which reflected in the world and the characters with you and who lived and who died, but those choices also got carried over to subsequent uh, sequels. So you'd carry over save games from Dragon Age 1 to Dragon Age 2, and all the choices you've made in the first game would then get respect to the second game, and then forward into the third game. Um, and respecting those was really important, but the problem was is that their team was so good at it that there was a bunch of players who didn't realize that they'd actually made a choice at all. And so then they were disappointed and um, because they felt like, oh, I, I didn't really get a choice in the matter. Like, this is just what happened. And it wasn't until they investigated later that, oh, actually, there's a lot of choices I've made, but it's just the team was so good at writing those choices and respecting the players' choices that are... Um, it felt very, very natural, which I was something I always uh, aspired to try to get to. But then when uh, I went to that talk, I was like, oh, actually, we, okay, yeah, you need to signpost the fact that the player made a choice. Um, he called it magic tricks in the dark. Um, I really, I really appreciated that. Yeah, I had trouble with a game that I worked on called All Walls Must Fall because there's time travel. So <laughs> not only can you make choices, but you can go back and try all the choices. If yeah, you want, wow. um, as that well. Um, <laughs> the cool thing about that was we got an opportunity to also make that as um, an actual game mechanic. So you can go into a conversation and then go backwards and forwards through the conversation and actually, you know, instead of just trying to come up with the right answer of one playthrough by making the right questions, um, players could actually go back to the beginning of the conversation and follow the different tracks um, to get the different answers and hopefully get all the bad puns that I put in there. Uh, just as a reminder, chuck your questions into the Q&A because I won't always remember to check in chat. Um, just for everybody who's doing it. Um, yeah, look, I, I, I'm with you guys. I think there's equal fun to be had and equal good meaningful stories to be had with both branching or non-branching storylines. Um, and even with... with um, you know, more non-linear stuff where you can choose the order in which you do something and still get an interesting story, regardless. Like your big role game playing games like um, The Witcher, where you can go through and, and it doesn't matter really what, some things are linear, other things aren't. So you can really pick and choose in that open world where you go and what you do at, at any given time. Um, though I did make the mistake of getting all my friends killed at the end because I forgot to kill somebody in that game. <laughs> I actually literally went and replayed it just because I'm like, no, no, I don't want my friends to die. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, and it's also too about, you know, respecting the player's time. You know, they, they want value in the choices that they're making. So there's no point having branching if they don't actually see the, the value in it. And, um, you know, Telltale Games did a nice little Swifty in one of theirs where the game actually popped up a little UI, a user interface saying, uh, you know, so-and-so has remembered this choice. Whether they actually did or not, like a yeah. lot of the time when a character remembered the choice, actually there was, it was not recorded anywhere, the choice made. Actually. Oh, they snuck it in? Oh, that's naughty. Uh, <laughs> sorry, spoilers. Spoilers for people who played the game. <laughs> um, so I actually did a workshop where I explained that and one guy was just devastated um, because he honestly thought these characters were remembering um, his choices and so on, um, you know, so, um, but if the chat player has any kind of perception that, you know, they're making choices that don't actually make a difference, um, or they can't see the difference, or they don't even know they're making choices, then that can be just as bad as not having any choices at all. 
I honestly believe that as a line of text, Clementine will remember that as the most effective piece of text ever written. In <laughs> history. It's like both a, a reward and a threat. Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. like you, they'll remember it whichever way you chose. So you might be doing something good or something bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so we've got a lot of questions here. I'm just going to try and cherry pick a few so that we don't leave people behind, but some I know will be answered in the next talk section. Mm -hmm. So. Um, what kind of work does a game writer do actually do in a game engine? So, um, in my case, it really was just literally editing the strings of text within the engine itself. But I had programmers who would help make everything connect properly. I did learn a bit on how to make things connect, but those things they, um, they would then do for you. So, usually it's working in tandem with somebody who knows what they're doing, so you don't break it. Um, yeah. I, I'm in the very unique position of Black Lab where as, uh, as a lead designer, as well as the writer, like I often um, going all the way from writing everything in Scrivener through to the VO direction, through to the implementation into engine, the level design. Um, and which is great when it comes to, you really want to get the nuances of timing and um, making sure objectives and uh, quests work the way that you want them to. Um, but it's also, uh, not very typical in the industry. Typically, there's at least multiple people uh, going through um, to do handling all of those steps. Yeah, yeah I'm just saying. Well, it was really cool when I was working in Engine in Sweden um, with um, Ubisoft Massive because uh, the cool thing about that was always, you know, I could basically they're, they're in a very good place where a lot of basically their entire process is in Engine, so everything from writing all the way through to implementation, and that was really cool because with some simple script writing. Um, just writing even just something that looks like a screenplay, I could basically hit a button and then go and play out what that scenario would look like in the game straight yeah. away. Um, and, you know, having, you know, obviously it's a very different case from, um, you know, film and television in particular. Um, obviously theatre is a little bit different, um, but just having the opportunity to, to do that myself, being empowered to be able to put this stuff in the engine straight away and see the results was actually really exciting stuff. I find it really helpful as well, knowing the context of how your text is going to appear in the game, how the voice is, where it's going to appear, the timing of it. Yeah. Um, like actually being able to put that in yourself and like the number of times where I've uh, had someone uh, like implementing one of our systems, they're like, oh, we just need some uh, random text and I'll just give them some draft uh, bits of UI text, user interface text or tutorial text. And then like half an hour later, they finished implementation and I've gone and I'm like, oh, wow, actually those words look completely wrong in that particular part <laughs> of the screen in this particular part yeah. of the game. And then I spend the next two hours like editing one string because like I'm trying to figure out the perfect way to make it fit inside of the UI panel and everything. So. I keep forgetting how long it takes for the character to get from one place to the other sometimes. And so if you're writing a scene where dialogue is happening, you know, sometimes you get that thing where you've implemented it, you go and play it, and then there's this big, long, awkward pause while the character has to walk out of the space, <laughs> even though the conversation is finished. It's... That thing about fixing things into your UI panel is a huge, huge deal, and it took a lot of time. The number of times I had the thesaurus out working on Ashen to try and make what they want us to say. And, and the thing about the dialogue for that game was that it had to cover a lot of bases. It had to give a quest, it had to tell story, it had to tell them where to go and what they wanted. And yet they wanted it done in blocks of about 70 words. Yeah, and I could have three panels. Because players don't read. They do not <laughs> want to read. It is a bad idea to make them read a lot of text. And, Some and, players don't read. Sorry, most players don't read. <laughs> I'm a writer and I don't read. Like, I read books, but when it comes to it, if there's too much text, I'm not going to read it. Um, it Players are there to play. doesn't take much. So um, that, that fine-tuning that and getting the right words in the right places that do all the right things, being able to do that directly in-game and test it immediately is really important because then you can see, have you, have you put so many words in that you've got orphans? So that you've got, a, you know, one word just sitting there by itself on the second line looks ridiculous. Um, and so you need to try and make so that it doesn't do that. And that's before you even get people doing voiceover, because often you've got both, um, you know, for Ash and they decided to do voiceover very, 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 very late in the project, like with two months to go kind of late. And so I'd written everything out to go on the screen and to just pop up on the screen. And then what you write to work on a screen and what works in, in voiceover aren't necessarily the same things. 
So it's a, it's a real challenge to, to wrangle that particular one. Um, somebody asked on a, a question about music, Phil asked what goes on music and is that part of the writing, pro writing process? Um, and it's a really interesting question. I'm quite spoiled because my other half is a sound designer and composer. And so we've worked together on a couple of projects. And um, one of the things that I stole the idea from Kim and got implemented in Ashen was to give every character a music track, which then when two characters were in the same space as each other, the music would uh, dynamically merge into one broader track that has their themes kind of or the instruments that represents them going through it. So there are really cool things you can do with music, um, but it doesn't often be an opportunity. Like we don't always, often music is done completely separately, so it just depends. How about you guys? Uh, yeah, I mean, yes. Music is also an underappreciated, I think, discipline in our industry. Um, and yet, there's such amazing potential because it is an interactive medium um, and then you can get the nice feedback loop between um, you know the player does something the music responds the player responds to the music and then the music can then respond to you know the player's reaction and there's yeah. some real beauty that can be done in that there's a few games that have used that to their advantage um, as well um, i'm trying to remember there was a game which had a character that um, basically did ballet um, through the the levels uh, and so basically the faster that you move through the levels, the faster the, the music um, did. And, you know, there's a few cues that the music would do then so that you could almost, um, you know, do your choreography in an appropriate place to pass the next part of the level. Uh, I know also to Alls Must Fall was really fun because whenever you finished a battle, um, the, it would do a replay um, to like, it was based in um, Berlin. So like this thumping electro like, soundtrack. Um, as the, the replay happened and that just kind of was an awesome reward for a player uh, once they made it through um, this, uh, this epic battle to then have this kind of, you know, thumping music, musical battle type scenario um, play out in front of them, almost like a video clip for them. Yeah, no doubt. One of the best reactions to one of our missions in Battlestar was this really great um, like I'm, very, I'm very proud of it because we, we get a lot of feedback from players about it being a highlight for them. It's the very end of our season one, uh, which I won't give any spoilers to there. But basically, it's like a big combination of the voice acting. Our actors gave some brilliant performances in this very high dramatic, high stakes moment. Our composer, uh, Ash Gibson Grieg, he, he gave us this brilliant piece of music where, um, like, as you can imagine, like, uh, as is befitting the uh, franchise, there's all, during our battles, there's typically lots of drums and lots of intense strings going on. And then for this mission, he just laid all that out and just, we had a really beautiful choral piece, uh, which really emphasized the tragedy of what was actually happening at the time. And then we had some new mechanics in that particular mission, um, and which all led up to the culminating to this big ending. Um, and. I think it's just that marriage of everything there from the audio to the performance to the mechanics was what allowed uh, really let players get into that moment and experience something different there. Yep. Um, so all of the questions that we've got around career stuff, Alexander's going to be able to answer. I think all of them, every time, single one of them. <laughs> sorry, every single question ever you wanted to know has the answer. Um, but I thought we might get to yours now and then we can try and tackle as many of these questions as we can um, as, as we wrap up. Um, we're happy to stay on after seven if um, people would like to hang around. You're more than welcome to and we'll see if we can, um, at least at the, the highest level, get, get some questions answered for you all. Right, take it away. Um, if we can do that. All right, can everyone see? I hope so. Um, right, so I'm Alexander Swords. Um, I, um, that's my Twitter handle there. Uh, always available to help um, people if you have any questions. My DMs are open. Um, please use them. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to jump in straight away. Um, this industry um, really uh, appreciates people who do things. So um, qualifications are important, especially for understanding the type of work that you're doing. Um, but demonstrating um, the work that you want to do or are trying to do um, is definitely key to succeeding in the industry. Um, so my first advice is to just do stuff 
now um, if you can. Um, and it's not that hard to do. So um, on the left hand side there, um, I know Anna also mentioned um, Lucidchart and um, Microsoft Visio. Diagrams.net is also a free flow charting program. A lot of the work that we do in the beginning um, is, is all flow charts. Um, it's how we think, it's how we communicate our ideas um, to the rest of the team a lot of the time. Um, so that's a really good place to start. Um, and, um, you know, you can just create those diagrams a little bit like what Anthony showed. Um, play with your ideas. I know there was a question there about adapting a film concept. Um, what you might want to do is, um, is put into a flow chart what the film concept is um, and then see where good branches are and see if you can make it work that way. That might be one way of assessing it. The other thing you can do um, is actually look on the, the right hand side here with the interactive narrative engines. Again, these are free um, and they have really amazing, very active, very passionate communities that have lots of really great resources about how to use it. So I don't even need to go through these engines um, tonight um, for you to be able to start using them. First of all, they're super simple. If you know how to use um, you know, Microsoft Word very well, you'll be fine. If you know how to use spreadsheets very well, you'll be fine. If you've ever worked on websites before, you'll probably be able to have um, a lot of fun um, with these engines. Twine is uh, a node-based system, so it looks a little bit like a flowchart, but there's constraints on how to make it happen. Ink and Yarn Spinner um, both use what we call markup, which is just um, you know uh, very specific text which tells um, uh, the back end of the program and what it might need to do to offer the different branches or different choices. Um, in its very basic form, the advantage over the, these narrative engines over flowcharts is um, they're able to export an HTML, um, uh, an HTML, um, basically. So like a web page um, where you can actually play through the stories afterwards. Um, Ink in particular is also really good because you can actually get a preview of what that looks like while you're actually using it. But all of them export into HTML that will look like your traditional, um, you know, choose your own adventure books. So, you know, text with options down the bottom. Um, all of these also have the options though of doing very fancy things uh, uh, once you get past that point. So you can do sound, you can embed um, images um, and video um, as well. So straight after this session, go to one of those websites, um, pick whichever one you think um, you're probably going to respond to. I would say just try out all three um, and get going. Uh, not right now though, because I've got more to talk about. Um, so a lot of questions that we've got from the Q&A were about getting hired. Um, I'm, I am making generalizations here, so obviously not, this isn't going to be this, the case with every single um, studio. It's just to give you a bit of a rundown of, you know, the different studio types and what you might expect in this kind of situation. So um, we've got indie or independent, that's the smaller end of town. Um, obviously with that, there are usually limited budgets, limited resources. Um, your role is more likely to be part-time or um, if you are full-time, it will be writing a narrative and something else like community management, marketing, business development. Um, so if you're really looking to work with like in the indie space for a studio, any other skills that you might have other than writing your narrative, you should be talking to those studios about perhaps bringing that experience um, into the studio. Um, they're usually very open to that because a lot of people in those teams are already wearing multiple hats. Um, there are very few roles uh, in Australia. We don't have a lot of independent studios. Um, we don't have a very big industry at all compared to some of the densities of Europe and, and North America. Um, but they're very open to having conversations, which is good. Um, and because of, because of the nature of things here, as well as um, overseas, they're very open to remote workers. And a lot of the time that's because they actually don't have an office space um, themselves or um, it's, it's a very small office space with this, or there might already be four people, you know, sitting on top of each other and they just don't have another uh, space for another person to necessarily be permanently in the office, especially for a part-time role. So um, the advantage of that though is um, Indies, international Indies tend to be a bit uh, more open to, um, you know, having remote workers who aren't necessarily in their own country. It's an international business as well. So they're not so afraid to have people um, working from different countries working for them as well. Um, also, too, if they're a country which, where English isn't a first language, you've already got a huge advantage in having English as um, your, uh, if you're fluent in English, um, English is a first language. Um, there's, it's just the reality that most of the market is English speaking, the American market in particular. Um, so there are a lot of Indies, um, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, who are always on the lookout for writers who have um, fluent English. 
Um, they do generally get to be more creative and more experimental because obviously they're in control of their own future um, and um, the um, creativity is, uh, is actually uh, a competitive advantage in this kind of environment for them. Uh, so what you'll need is familiarity with the tool. That's one of those three that I was just talking about, Twine, Inc. or Yard Spinner. Follow of examples. Definitely make sure that they're all interactive examples. That will put you in good stead. Um, some of them will ask for um, linear, um, but you definitely have to have um, non-linear examples. Um, you can deliver it in one of those tools that I was just talking about as an HTML, it's super easy. Um, you're in computer, software and internet, obviously. Uh, your management processes are super important because if you're part of a small team, you're probably not gonna have someone who's designated to managing you. So if you're good at working for yourself and managing your own processes, you're gonna do really well with an Indian team. And you have to be really good with online collaboration skills. So you need to know Google Docs, um, how all that works, how real-time collaboration works, all the sharing functions, uh, programs like um, Slack that you need to use to communicate, some of the other programs that Anna was talking about earlier. At the big end of town, we've got AAA. I don't actually know why it's called AAA. I've never bothered to look it up, um, but it is big commercial games. This is Ubisoft, Bethesda, Activision Blizzard, um, you know, that sort of level. Um, and um, obviously bigger teams, bigger projects, a lot of money. Having said that, limited time. They usually make very big promises without necessarily understanding even how long it's gonna to take to make those promises, which means everyone is short on time. That can end up being in a bit of a crunch situation like Anna was talking about earlier. Um, there's also limited resources for narrative as well. Um, these games tend to be mechanics driven, so what the verbs, what people are doing in the game. It does mean that if you are in a big meeting, uh, narrative does struggle for legitimacy sometimes and often um, design will override um, any of the priorities that narrative might have. Um, and that, that's just the reality. Um, there is a strong culture that players are there to play. And so design, the, the design of the play will always come first over narrative, um, which, is, um, which is fair enough. Um, lots of full-time roles available. None that I'm aware of in Australia at the moment because um, we have a very limited uh, uh, presence of AAA in Australia, um, but um, I would say there is actually a shortage of, of narrative people um, trying to fill the number of roles that the bigger studios have got. Obviously, with things being the way they are at the moment, that may, may change, um, but I'm just seeing lots and lots of ads from AAAs who are um, looking for, um, for writers, particularly people with um, English as their, as their first language. Um, and to answer a question from before, a lot of them don't require you to have had a game um, launched before. You don't have had to work on a game before. A lot of the ads will just ask that you either have a degree um, and you know, you've worked in film or TV or uh, on the stage um, or VR or AR, um, all those sorts of things. And then you have a folio to kind of match that. Um, the AAA studios also have the advantage um, in that. Um, so I'm getting, I'm getting lots of things coming up. Do I need to? Okay, cool. Sorry, I just want to check chat because my, my screen's flashing at me. Um, um, I've forgotten what I was saying. Roles. Yeah, so you don't need to, you don't need to um, work on a game before. Um, they, they have the advantage of being so big that you can go on as a junior, uh, which means you don't have had to have had any experience before. You just need to show that you can write. Um, and that takes me to what you need, familiarity with a tool. You need to know at least one of those tools extremely well, which isn't to say that it's going to be the tool that you're using when you actually get um, onto one of these jobs, um, but you'll be in very good stead um, if you turn up to that interview being able to say, yes, I know Twine by that, um, or yes, I've used Ink to, to make my own games before. Um, so a folio of examples. With this, because they're open to less experienced people, um, nonlinear is okay. Um, even, you know, uh, um, screen formatted um, samples are fine, and a lot of them will actually say that in the ads. Uh, in terms of actually like how much or what type, read the ads, give them what they need. There is no one size or fits all kind of portfolio for these types of jobs. So read the ad, um, take a punt, try and ask someone in games uh, if you're not so sure. You have to be really, you have to have really good interpersonal skills. If you're used to working on your own or in small teams and that's the way you prefer to work, AAA is not for you. You will spend a lot of time in meetings, you'll spend a lot of time having to explain and sell your ideas um, to the rest of the team. Yep. And will, willingness and ability to move overseas is also super important. Um, obviously, we have a limited presence of AAA here. 
um, which means overseas is going to be the way to go. They very rarely do remote. Um, they reduce sometimes they'll do freelancers to maybe um, fill some gaps if they're struggling to, to meet, but often they'll want people in-house. The good thing is though, a lot of the time they will actually provide some assistance for that. Um, freelancing is the other way to go, um, and this is my um, bread and butter. Um, so what you'll be doing a lot of the time is writing to a brief, a very specific brief. You'll be managing your own processes. So you're running a small business, you're running yourself like a small business. Managing expectations is huge because a lot of the time if you're freelancing, um, the AAAs have it kind of understood, but a lot of Indies still don't really understand exactly how narrative works. Um, so you'll need to kind of manage their expectations and how long it takes things to, to happen, um, what the processes are, what the deliverables are, are actually very, very important. Um, before you sign any agreement, make sure that everyone understands exactly what the deliverables are and what they, what they look like. Um, and that can be different from gig to gig. Sometimes it's world building, sometimes it's dialogue, sometimes it's editing, um, all sorts of different things. You can start at any stage of production. It's what I was talking about before. Uh, it's actually very rare for me to actually start on the beginning of game development. A lot of the time, they're you know, halfway through development of the game. Um, so you need to be able to be very good at, at extracting all the information from the rest of the team about what they're trying to make. Because a lot of the time, you know, designers are storytellers, artists are storytellers, um, audio are storytellers as well. They've all got their own idea about what the story is going on in this game, even if nothing is actually written down. So you need to go to all these people, make sure you get all their input about what they think the story is, because collectively they have some idea of what the story is, even if it's not written down. It's also a very good way to get buy-in um, as well, make sure that everyone feels like they've been heard. Um, you have to work with existing documentation. That's also about extracting information and changing your workflows to fit in with the way they do things. Creating documentation yourself, if you're a process-driven person, you're going to do well. Um, and um, I would say almost all work will be remote. Again, a lot of these teams, um, if it's especially if it's a shorter contract, you, they're not going to have a space for you um, in the office. They will where, you, where they can, um, but a lot of the time they won't. Um, and also too, it's quite competitive in Australia. Um, so by nature, a lot of the freelanc freelancing will end up being international. A lot of the things you need are basically everything that you need from the, the from this previous slide, because you kind of have to be, um, you know, you kind of have to be everything to, to everyone, um, which isn't to say that you'll be doing everything every single time. Um, but if you've got some versatility, um, that will help you get, you know, more gigs sooner. Having said that, though, if you are a specialist in some, you know, particular aspect, um, there is a career to be had there as well. You're just going to find it a bit, it'll take a bit longer to kind of build the profile. I will also just say, you know, the, the, the three bottom ones there are, are different. Um, if you're going to freelance, the ability to travel is super important. We have things like the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco, Gamescom um, in Europe. Um, you have to be seen, you have to be talking to studios because even though they're open to remote work, they're going to be far more open if you're able to walk the walk and talk the talk in that kind of environment. Um, we have Melbourne Games Week here. I don't know what that's going to look like this year, um, but we do have um, GCAP, um, Games Connect Asia Pacific as our conference. Um, it is very good. Um, to get different levels of understanding um, of the industry and how it works. You will have people who are just new to the industry who are talking about their experience coming into the industry, which might be very useful for a lot of you, um, as well as um, people like myself, Anthony and Anna, who are, are a lot more experienced. So, um, and again, um, then it's about talking to people, um, you know, trying to understand what they want. Um, and if you're trying to be a specialist, that's, you have to do that. Public speaking or content creation is also super important. Social media is a lot of the time how you get profile in this industry, as well as public speaking. Public speaking feeds into social media. So if you're quite, if you understand your process in particular, like I am, um, then you might be able to do similar to what I have. I've got all of my work at the moment has come from my public speaking um, appearances, as well as the book that I've written. So. Um, if you understand process to that extent, um, which isn't to say that because you don't have experience in games, you can't speak. Um, you can also speak about, you know, what skills you have in film that might come across. That is also where the now industry and our industry is always willing to, to listen to other people. Co-working spaces also help as well. The more you are around games people, the more likely you are to get work, the more likely you are to understand the language. Uh, we have the arcade in Melbourne, um, so we're very lucky with that. Uh, and um, there is an advantage of being that space for me as a freelancer in particular, because we have a bunch of studios um, having lots of good conversations about everything that's going on. 
Um, going your own way is legit. Um, in the same way that film and television stage is um, as well. Um, I would say at the moment in particular, there's a, a lot of uh, money flowing all over the place for lots of different reasons. Um, there's lots of big players who've moved into our industry um, and they're willing to pay for the content. Um, I, I want to say though, that doesn't necessarily mean that, um, you know, if you do this, money is going to fall from the skies um, and you'll get to make a game. Uh, but um, I would say at the moment, at least, money is far more accessible in a, in a few different ways. The way you go about it in a very basic, very general kind of way is make a prototype. This industry works on what you have, things that people can play. So again, go back to one of those tools um, that I spoke about at the beginning, um, and you can um, use that to build a prototype. Um, if it's uh, if it's a, you know a, a text heavy game, then maybe you can build a prototype as it would be in the final game. If it's something that's got more gameplay elements, then just write the gameplay um, like you would a treatment. Um, so your choices then might become about what gameplay options you want to provide at different kind of moments. Um, and you can do that at quite a high level as well. You don't need to necessarily write the exact game. You could write it all as a kind of treatment style um, as well. But if you do it in that tool, people will understand where the key decisions are being made and at least start to get some idea of what you're trying to achieve. Um, next, go to um, find yourself a game designer who's fluent in this language uh, and can help you create, turn that prototype and your ideas into a game design document. Um, so that's uh, kind of the equivalent of a, a Bible, I guess, but it's um, a lot more kind of system oriented as well. Um, but that's how our industry understands what a game might look like, um, prototypes and a game design document. Um, and those, there's lots of opinions on what they look like and, and how to do them. Um, search the internet, there are some good examples and some bad ones. Um, but um, inform yourself, having a game designer will help. Um, and then Find someone to help with business development. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean you need to find someone in games to help with the business development. A lot of film producers or executive producers, anyone who's you know, worked at that level of getting a project up can probably start coming into games and pretty quickly understand um, how to do the sell. A lot of the pitching is very kind of similar. Um, where it kind of differs is um, you know, the, the options we have for distribution and the way the money kind of flows through from that. So you are going to be better off getting someone who has worked in games before, um, but I know a lot of you have worked with some very talented people who um, seem to be able to get money from nowhere. Um, the money is definitely there. So um, if you can end up working with some of those um, and get a bit of expertise on how to navigate the game space, um, then that's also worthwhile, worthwhile doing. Otherwise, you know, find someone in games. Um, the funding options that you do have, um, obviously we've got government, but it's very different. Like we don't have federal funding um, and it's very different from state to state. So um, the IGEA um, have information on their website about what the different options are for um, different states. I'm sorry, I don't have it up on my slide. I should have done that. Um, but what they usually do is only fund part of the game and that's usually a prototype or a vertical slice. Prototype is um, a version of the game which may not look very good, but you'll be able to play through the mechanics and get an idea of what the game should be. Vertical Slice is actually a section of the game that only lasts for a certain amount of time that is somewhat closer to what the game should look like finally. Um, so there's limited funding there. They, they very generally don't um, fund entire projects, but you can use a prototype and a vertical slice to then go on and get funding from publishers or platforms. Um, and that's the way that it flows. So publishers are, you know, international, they're very dependent on game genre and audience, um, and they do have a range of involvement in production. And what that means is different publishers will get involved in your game in different ways, um, with different options about how much money will put in. Um, most of the time it comes down to a recruitment deal. So they'll say, cool, I'll give you 400 grand to get this game finished, but you'll take care of marketing yourself. And, you know, uh, I want, 60% of revenue until recruitment um, is done as a random example. You know, that's the type of deal they'll do. So again, if you've got someone who knows how to do the money stuff, <laughs> very useful for that type of conversation. Publishers at the moment are very open to taking pictures. I've had chats with different publishers who specifically asked me to recommend people who aren't from games to consider moving into games because at the moment, uh, a lot of these publishers are looking for, you know, uh, games that really reach their audiences um, and games aren't necessarily providing what they're looking for. So um, if you've got anything particularly creative or something different or, um, you know, a particular theme that you think your game will 
um, really connect with audiences. And you may actually find a publisher straight out of the gate um, who will help you make that happen. Platforms have recently come in to provide lots of money, mostly for exclusivity um, for the different services. Um, the big ones there are um, Apple Arcade and Xbox. Apple Arcade um, is a subscription service, um, but the word on the street is that they're really looking for narrative and they're really prizing narrative content. So a lot of the conversations I've had with studios is because they've had a conversation with Apple. Apple have told them they want more narrative in the game. They've come to me to find out how to make that happen. And Xbox just want everything um, because they don't, <laughs> they're a game developer um, and um, they want the entire world. Uh, so they want a game for everybody. And sometimes that's the way they talk. They want on their subscription service, you know, their, their buzz line is, you know, the next game, your next favorite game. So they want everything um, and they're talking to everyone about it. So ID at Xbox is the team that looks after um, indie games there um, and they're always willing to, to take pictures um, from people. Um, just a little plug, how are we going for time? Oh, I need to rush. Um, just a little plug, um, that's the name of my book, The Forest Paths of Method, Forest Paths and Method of Narrative Design. Um, that's basically how I work, um, matching the theory up with the practice, available on Amazon. Um, coming soon though, James has said that I can say we're working on bringing you a narrative design workshop to members of the AWG. So I know a lot of you have been asking about workshops and stuff, um, and James and I are definitely working on it. We know it's a priority, so uh, watch this space. Um, I'm assuming members will get emails. Um, if you're in Victoria, just a quick plug for the Creators Fund. If you're looking at moving from any medium to another medium, the Creators Fund is up to 50K uh, to facil facilitate you to do that. Um, the idea is that from that 50K, you're able to pay yourself as well as any resources you need to research the new skills and learn the new skills. Um, so it's not about a project. You don't need a project. You don't even need to mention a project. Um, but if you're coming from something that isn't games and say you want to bring what you know from your medium into games, um, Creative Victoria may just give you fifty thousand uh, dollars to do that. I'm, I don't know of any other equivalent um, fund in any of the other states. I'm sorry, um, but at the moment too, with a lot of the COVID um, funds that are out there, check them because a lot of them have very low restrictions. So maybe you'll be able to get up to five k um, to help you do that. Games to play very very quickly. Um, the ones at the top: Eighty Days, Oxen Free, A Night in the Woods. All these games were made with tools like Twine, Inky, and Yarn Spooner. Eighty Days itself was actually made in um, in Inky. Um, so obviously, there's a lot of other things going on in the background, lots of spreadsheets. Um, but it's worthwhile playing those games just to see how you can go through that process. What I was talking about before, we can prototype in one of those tools, um, then um, come up with a pitch, and then make it into a full game. Um, so this would be the end product of, of that process. Um, games with no words, I think is really, really important because um, those tools are a lot about words. Um, I think these games, Florence, Barlow and Sales and the Gardens Between are amazing stories told with no words at all. Um, so if you're one of those kind of, especially, you know, screen or stage writers who, who really like non-verbal communication or environmental storytelling, um, those are the games for you. Uh, and games with a good story, Firewatch, uh, Never Alone and It Will Be Hard, uh, games that I always recommend. Um, Firewatch in particular would be good for people in Sagecraft because it feels, it has that kind of theatric nature to it. Um, Never Alone is amazing, especially if you're, if you're interested in documentaries um, or you're a documentary writer, um, Never Alone is, is your game because it does a really great job of actually, they worked with um, the native population in Alaska, I think, or Canada. Oh, that's terrible. Anyway, um, and then they incorporated a lot of the, the documentary stuff that they um, captured into the game. Um, so have a look at that one. It Will Be Hard is also really good because it's an example of a game um, that's more like a comic, because um, I did see comic kind of mentioned a few times there. It's more like a comic, and the agency there isn't about getting your player, sorry, getting your character to do different things. It's about following the different perspectives of the story. Um, so, you know, the player doesn't actually have any presence in the story. They're just choosing um, which path to take on um, how they want the story told to them, depending on which character they end up following. So definitely worthwhile looking at. And this is just the slide from the beginning um, so that people can either take screenshots or um, quickly jump on those websites um, to um, have a look at those after the session. I am on Twitter, seriously, if you have any questions after the session, my DMs are open, um, send me a message. 
Um, that's the best way of um, getting in contact with me. If you're not on Twitter though, and you do have questions, um, there's a contact form on my website, please um, use it. I love getting questions that way as well. So thanks, that's all for me. Thank you. Man, we have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, okay. The good thing yeah. is, I actually think a lot of these questions, especially when it comes into the depths of the craft, are things that can be used for, um, for that workshop because yes. they're, they're really good good questions, they're great ones about craft. There's a lot around things like pitching your idea and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that, which is, um, that's where it's like, go make the game yourself because almost nobody asks writers to come and pitch them an idea because there are a bajillion ideas. Um, that's really important to, to be aware of. Um, where to find um, all of these mysterious job ads? Uh, social media is your friend. Like. It's just everything that goes onto an official website gets plastered all over social media as well because people are looking for people and they'll reach out for you. Um, yeah. a few people if you do have, about, oh, sorry, Anna. I was going to say, a few people asked about if you, ha if you need an agent. Um, I don't know anybody who has an agent. Not for writing games. I know writers who have an agent, but they don't use their agent for writing in games. And I've had a couple of chats with um, like film agents and stuff and they just don't. They don't go into that space. They don't understand it. So, um, unfortunately, that's well. That's probably one thing we should talk about. Um, we don't have agents. We don't have. Um, there's a lot of not a lot of knowledge, collective knowledge, or even collective knowledge held anywhere about what we do and how we do it and how much we get paid to do it. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, so it is definitely a case that we all need to keep talking to each other to make sure that we all look after each other when it comes to this sort of stuff. Um, and again, I'm happy to answer some of those questions um, as well. Um, I will say now, because it's public knowledge anyway, that usually I start between $80 and $100 an hour for high level consultation. That's usually like narrative director kind of role um, advice that I give. A lot of the time when I'm working for studios, it ends up being bumped down to you know, $50 to $60 an hour, depending on the length of the contract and the type of work that they're doing. Um, and but also too, sometimes too, studios just need like just a bit of world building or um, just a bit of touch up of dialogue or even just a bit of a character consult and stuff. Um, and so then I kind of bump it down again um, as well. Um, I would recommend that you charge by the hour and not by the word. I know some writers do by the word, um, but you're selling, always probably going to sell yourself short if you uh, if you're costing yourself by the word instead of by the hour because yeah. it should be prizing your knowledge and valuing all the previous hours that you've done instead yeah. of your ability to type fast. Plus the iteration in games, it's not like they, like charging by the way, it gets very complicated if you're iteration and rewriting things multiple times. That, I could see that would be a nightmare. I um, wouldn't even know how to keep track of the number of words. No, that would just be, yeah. <laughs> just, I mean, I think for Ashen, I wrote somewhere in the vicinity of 20,000 words altogether. But then there were whole sections that were cut that were more and then other things that were changed or rewritten at least two or three or four or five times. So the actual total word count of what I did in, in sort of 10 months working full time with them was, um, yeah, a lot more than that. Um, uh, just to, on pay rates, um, it does go lower, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> uh, especially if working full time, uh, most of my gigs are closer to the 35 to 40 dollars an hour. Um, makes me cry because I, I do instructional design corporate work on the other side and it's more than twice that. Um, this is not a choice for a way to make tons of money, um, especially if you're local to Australia. International clients, if you can get an American one at the moment, um, the American dollar is amazing. Uh, so my, my husband's working on a, a um, Abe's Odyssey game at the moment as a sound designer and the pay packets are ridiculous because he's getting twice what it would have been if we were on parity. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, working for an Israeli studio at the moment and they pay in American. Oh, so so they asked me if that was okay and I went, yes. <laughs> That's wonderful, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so um, so yeah, when you can get that, that freelance work. But a lot of it's around, um, you know, my path has been very much working with local people. Um, New Zealand counts as local as far as I'm concerned. That's where Aurora 44, who did um, Ashen, are located. Um, but I did have to go over there for that job which is an interesting one. So often that, that desire for you to travel and be in-house is a big one. Um, uh, so a few people have asked lots of detailed questions that I think that you can answer later on. Um, 
list of publishers, Rod, uh, yes, they're everywhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you Google game publishers, you will find a list. Um, you'll find multiple lists. Um, uh, places for jobs, again, we've, we've more or less covered that one. Um, uh, yeah, and I'll just reiterate too, um, you know, conferences and things as well. Uh, yeah, they're a big deal. A most, a lot of the, so a lot of the first jobs that I got um, when I first started the industry um, were things like I would have a conversation with someone and then I would have a conversation with them three months later and then ask yes. them how their game is going three months later and then I would get a gig. I'm lucky enough that I have a profile at the moment. I've done a lot of public speaking recently that a lot of work does come to me. Um, but I still have, you know, I, I use TweetDeck to keep track of all of the keywords um, for narrative um, roles. Um, AAA are all over LinkedIn. So if you're a LinkedIn magician, um, that can also be a place to, um, to go to. Um, if you are more discerning and looking for a particular type of game you want to work on, um, particularly games, you know, favorite games that you've got, um, then find out who the studio is and um, send them a cold email. Do not try and sell yourself at them though. Um, merely just, you know, acknowledge with them that you, um, you enjoyed the game, you enjoyed the experience. Um, and if there is an opportunity for, for you to help them, um, then perhaps you're available. Um, but um, just be very careful with the cold calling because studios get cold called by a whole bunch of people all the time. Yeah. Often it's, it's that networking and making connections with people. This is an industry, I imagine, much like film and television, which is very much about who you know. Um, and, and it'll be somebody that you see at GDC every year, that's the Game Developers Conference in America, or somewhere else, and then a few years later, a project comes up, they've got you in mind because they've talked to you and they remember who you are, you go out to the drinks nights with them and all that sort of thing. But importantly, it's it's often not other writers, but it's the game designers, it's the producers, the creative directors. They're the ones who will be looking for a writer because yeah. writers don't often, we do work in teams, but it's not so common in the indie to mindy kind of, you know, middle double A, I think we call it these days. We're all battery sizes for some reason. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that's that's a big deal for, for how you find people and, and make yeah. this all happen. Yeah, um, there, there are gaming events happening all the time, kind of everywhere. I mean, not, not so much in Australia um, because we have a smaller industry, but if you're happy to either move overseas or you're looking for international clients and you could easily easily kind of line up a few events um, in Europe and just bounce from, from one to the other um, within a month. So April, from memory this year was supposed to be, um, although it didn't happen, but usually what happens is um, there's London Games Week um, at the beginning of April, and there's usually a few days free, and then there's Berlin Games Week um, at the end of that week for the next two weeks. Um, and then I think there's one week and then Nordic Game Jam, um, and then there's another event after that as well. So, you know, if you're in a privileged position where you really want to invest in making the, the transfer over and you have to do international, you could easily do like a bit of a, a mini tour. Otherwise you could try and get into the American market, but they're a, a, they're a bit more difficult to kind of deal with because of visa restrictions and the tax thing is a little bit of a hassle. Um, but the Canadians are also really good as well. The Canadians have a freelancer visa as well, where you can turn up and if you manage to get a freelancer gig, they'll basically let you freelance um, until you can, I think it's at least six months um, and then see what your options are. Um, uh, as well. If you're young, the working holiday visa will allow you to work for indie studios um, in Europe as well, in the Schengen zone though, and obviously the UK is not a part of that anymore. I'd also like to reiterate as well, like the local communities in Australia are very, very active and very, yep. very broad as well. Um, so, you know, over east you've got IGDA Melbourne, IGDA Sydney, over here over the west we've got Let's Make Games. Um, and there's always folks coming up out of those communities with their international contacts as well, because lots of folks go over to GDC to make their publisher connections, as Alexander was talking about. Um, and so it's good just to uh, attend those events. Like, uh, we're an events-heavy industry, I feel. Yeah. Um, Game Jams is also a really good place, yes. too. That's, that's uh, where I started, um, Game Jams. Oh, you know, great. Getting to know people and, and saying, hey, do you want a writer? And they're like, what the hell would we do with one of those? I'm like, well, let me show you. <laughs> <laughs> But jams are awesome for that because it's one of the few times where they're like, all right, let's... Yeah, what the heck? Um, what the only thing with game jams is that you have to be up for staying up really long. Yeah, the so global game jam happens every year um, and there's presence in that for every single city uh, as well. Everyone gets in one or two places in the city 
um, and you know, personal hygiene goes up. No, I'm kidding. It's an old <laughs> stereotype. Um, um, but it means that everyone is together, and that's just a really good place to really kickstart um, kickstart your network. Um, you can go online and do online game jams as well, but it's a bit harder than uh, than to um, you know to really network with people um, kind of properly. Um, but yeah, game jams for sure. Now, one thing we, a few people have been asking me again about making a pitch, cold calling, all the, those sorts of things. One thing we didn't cover is um, well, often when somebody's advertising, they'll ask you to do a little writing test. Um, now, that can be, that varies enormously. Uh, the job I have at the moment, they asked everybody to write them a 100-word story about a particular topic. Um, other ones, I've been asked to write a small quest in the style of this game, like a particular game. In the case of the previous one, it was like a Stardew Valley game. So if I were to create a new character and write a thing for that, what really, really helps with any writing test is that if it's a company that you're interested in working with, play the games that they've made already. That's really important. And don't tell them you hate them because um, I, I know somebody who did that in an interview and funnily enough, didn't get the job. Because she said, oh, I really hate this kind of game. It's like, oh, well, that's the kind of game we make. So why are we even wasting our time? So, you know, play the games. Um, and, and play a really diverse range of games because not just the narrative heavy ones, but play the other ones as well. Because, you know, Zelda's massively popular. So is Doom. So is, you know, all sorts of different kinds of games. Um, the quirky indie ones are really fantastic. But the big blockbuster Call of Duty 500, whatever, it's up to these days are worth playing to understand the industry well. Don't spend all your money all at once. Xbox Game Pass is fantastic. It's very cheap at the moment, um, and there's always sales and things. So there's there's ways to get your hands on stuff. Sorry, I was just going to mention there's the Epic Mega Sale which is going on at the moment. And there's mm -hmm. some absolutely brilliant games which are dirt cheap. I think you can get Super Giant's <laughs> Transistor for like three bucks, wow. um, which is always one of my first games on my reading list for students. So yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm sorry, everybody, that we haven't gotten to every question. Um, we've tried our best, but it's already 7.30, so I think we might have to sign off. Um, there's one really interesting question that we all got asked, which was, uh, we have what many people would consider to be a dream job. The question is, what is our dream job? What would I, we like to be working on? Hmm. Alexander? I'm, I'm busy typing. Hang on, I'm just giving everyone the link. I'll, I'll, I'm giving I'll everyone the link to the, um, the IGDA um, writing special interest group. Awesome. Cool, yeah. Um, I, I feel like that they're right. Like, I do consider this my dream job. Um, I think what I would personally like to uh, take control of is uh, more personal games um, or lot, working with larger games as well or something. Um, I would also, uh, I, at some point, I would very much like to dip my toe over into television writing personally, because I'm a big fan of character drama. Um, but uh, if if I end up being a narrative designer for the next 30 years, I certainly won't be complaining. Fair enough. Um, to answer the question for me, um, I do want to create my own game. Um, so I'm, I've just started on that path, which is part of the reason why I know the path it's, at the moment. It is the path of madness. It is the path of madness. Um, I hope not. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm really good with scope, actually. So okay. I'm pretty good at um, keeping things in check. I've um, done the whole um, uh, producing side of things. So I know the nightmare. Yeah. Um, but no, I, part of it is too, like I'm interested in actually um, bringing a bit of the magic of stage into a more kind of interactive contained environment. So the project's going to be uh, all those sorts of lines. Also, uh, an adult story, um, an Australian story, in an actual drama, not high yeah. fantasy or sci-fi or anything like that. Um, I had my mum actually ranted at me when we were drunk one night because um, she likes playing games. She's like 69 or something and she plays games like two to four hours a day. And she's like, I really love these games. Where the fuck are the stories that I respond to? Excuse my French. Um, where are the stories that I can relate to, you know, as an older person, as someone who likes drama, you know, it's, it's, she likes those kind of hidden object games, but they've all got very twee kind of stories about, you know, women who are, you know, look powerful, but then have some man come along and solve all their problems for them. Um, yeah. That's how she described them to me. Um, you know, so I'm making, a, I'm making a game for my mom. That's my dream job. I'm making a game for my mom. That's so sweet. Yeah. 
Um, for me, I want to make a game that has the same sort of impact on somebody that I had at the end of playing Mass Effect 3, which was literally, I, I finished the game, I was heartbroken, because the, the, of all, I played all three endings and all of them were just like, <laughs> just rip your heart out. And it was wonderful because it's so rare for a game to give you such, um, I'm not going to spoil the ending, but it gives you a not obviously positive everybody wins kind of ending. And, and after three games worth of story that I got really engaged with those characters, um, that, that delight and enjoyment. So that was the Mass Effect series, the Mass Effect 1, 2 and 3. Please don't play Mass Effect Andromeda first. That is not <laughs> <laughs> I do play it though, because it is a lovely game. Yeah, look, I liked it, but it, yeah, it, uh, it had a big, it's like writing that sequel to a film that was amazing, and yeah. you just, it's impossible to, to match up to expect. Uh, games can definitely move people. I made the mistake of playing Florence on a train, and I got a bit teary towards mm -hmm. the end. Uh, yeah. The really sad part about that was it was a test version. They hadn't even finished it yet, and <laughs> I was helping them test it. So um, yeah, I definitely, I definitely hear you on that one. Yeah, yeah. So yes, playing a, a game like that or making a game like that would be yeah, my dream. Hard, really hard, and the pressure for that is massive. So, you could do it. You could you do know, it. I see what you did there. Massive. The pressure. Is... <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> okay. On that good effect. Um, yeah, anyway, feel free to friend me on Facebook. Um, I'm not overly discriminating. I can point you in directions of things. I'm not on Twitter because I really don't like Twitter, but I'm also on LinkedIn, so that. you can send me messages there and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, cool. Cool. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, do go on to Alexander's Next Steps funds, um, and we may do something like this again. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the AWG and um, Screen Australia for the opportunity as well. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Good night. All right. Take care. Take care.